Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you all. Happy, happy September. It's felt like September this week, hasn't it? Has anyone had the heating on? <gasps> you have. See, James, I was, put, I was pushing to have it on. Yeah, it's definitely getting to that kind of month, isn't it? But we are holding on to the, the very last remnants of summer this morning as I bring the, the last message in our summer message series from Hebrews called the Hall of Faith. And I'm, I'm really excited that I get to share with you this morning. It's a brilliant passage of scripture. It's actually not in Hebrews 11. It's the beginning of Hebrews 12. But it's such an, an encouraging, stirring kind of final trumpet call, if you like, at the end of Hebrews 11. And I, I know that God's going to speak to us. He's going to inspire us. He's going to spur us on and our walk with Jesus this morning. So in a second, I'm gonna, we're going to read this scripture together. But just in case, you know, you, you're new or you haven't been following our Hebrews message here, just to put it into context a little bit for you. So this passage is part of a letter to the Hebrews, the, the Hebrew church. Now, the Hebrew church is, is well established and they've been following Jesus for a long time. But as we've been hearing over the summer, the Hebrew church uh, are going through a bit of a hard time at the minute. They're being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. And the Hebrew Christians are, are tempted to, to give up. They're tempted to, you know, let's forget about the whole Jesus thing. They're considering going back to their old former lives. And the purpose of not only kind of Hebrews 11 in this passage, but the purpose of the whole book of Hebrews has been to say, you know, no, don't, don't give up. Keep going press on. Don't look back. Don't forget what Jesus has done. Don't forget what Jesus is going to do. Keep going, keep going, keep going. That's the whole message of Hebrews. Now in Hebrews 11, which we've been looking at, the writer has given the Hebrews like a long list of, of faithful examples of people who did just that. People who who kept going, people who stayed faithful to God as a bit of a, an inspiration and encouragement for them. You know, it's saying, you know, remember, remember Noah, remember Abraham, remember Moses, remember Rahab. These people kept going and you can too. Now, our passage this morning then comes at the end of this great list of people, great list of inspirational people of faith who kept going. And here comes our passage for this morning. So let's read that together. You might want to get it up on your phones or if you've got a Bible. So you can it, but it'll come up on the screens. If not, don't worry. Okay. So remember, this comes right at the end of that big, great list of heroes of the faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Wow, such an amazing passage, isn't it? And this passage, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. This passage refers to the Christian life as a race. So if you're a Jesus follower in here this morning, if you've decided to follow Jesus, this might be good news or bad news, but you are in a race. And that race lasts your whole life and you're expected to run the whole thing. So I reckon this will kind of divide us in our church family here because I know we've got some keen runners who will be absolutely buzzing at the idea of, yeah, I get to run with Jesus my whole life. Where are you? Give us a hand. Wave. Naomi, where are you? Nathan Davis, Andy. Yeah, I know. Avril, right. You're like, yes, I get to run with Jesus. Woohoo. And anybody else might fall into my category where you're like, that sounds like hard work. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely me. Yeah, you see, there's... Um, you know, I'm one of these people. I did the couch to 5K in lockdown, as I felt I should probably try and do something. And I sometimes go out for a, a slow jog if I'm pressured by some friends. But um, I don't enjoy the feeling when I'm running. I enjoy that kind of smug feeling afterwards where I feel like I can have like a chocolate bar or something. But 
actually during the run, it's just awful. So this was um, a quote from Eric Liddell. I don't know if you've heard of him. The Christian Olympian who the film Charts of Fire was about. And he, he famously said, you know, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I definitely do not feel God. I think what I feel is more like the fires of hell when I run. And so whatever group you're in, you're in a race. And we've got quite a different approach to running in our family too. So um, I've got three little boys. My middle son, Seth, he's a run to win kind of guy. So he you know, if he doesn't think he can win, he won't bother. So he's one of those, he'll really go for it. But if he gets halfway and someone's overtaking, he'll be like, ah, oh, there's no point. I'm going to give up. Whereas Noah, my eldest, like, could not be more different. He doesn't have that competitive sporting edge. So I remember we took him to his, his first sports day in school, James Nine. He must have been like four or five. And he's got his little pee kit in and he's at the starting line. And you can just see him thinking like, why would I be bothered about getting to there faster than these kids? And the start, and like the, the starting gun goes, and he's like, okay, like just, go, and like he's just not got that edge. And we went to it at the end, he's got all these like participation stickers on his PE kit, and we're like, oh, son, well done, let's have a look. And he's like, last, last, last third. <laughs> What's for tea? Like that's, that's, Noah's, that's Noah's stance on like competitive racing. And we've got another son, Jude. Now, uh, he's only three, so we don't really know what his, look at what, what his kind of endeavor into his sporting career is going to look like. But he's, you know, if, if you know Jude, I think it's clear he, he is going to make his mark on this world in some significant way. But something tells me it's, it's not going to be the world of athletics, but who knows, who knows. Anyway, regardless of whether you're more of a Seth or more of a Noah or more of a Andy Kahn or more of a Sarah Shepherd, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are in a race. You're in a race. Now, the, the letter, like the, the person who wrote the letter of Hebrews and the Apostle Paul both refer to the Christian life as a race. It's not just in Hebrews that we see it. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, the Apostle Paul, when he had, had got to the end of his life, he famously said, you know, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. The Apostle Paul and the writer to Hebrews, uh, they know, you know, they know nothing of this idea of coasting Christianity. It's just not really in their, in their mindset. You know, it's a race and you run and you run until the end. Now, this means that we, we follow after Jesus with, with all that we are. We pursue him with our whole lives. We give him our passion and we give him our energy. We remain committed to him. We remain disciplined in our spiritual life. He is number one. He's the Lord of our, our hearts and our whole lives and our very lives are centered around running after him. That's what it means to, to follow Jesus. And we do that until the end. It's not a, it's not a sprint. It's a long distance race, but there's no, there's no kind of sprinting off at the start and then jogging towards the end. We run the whole thing. We pace ourselves to keep going. And I, I remember I first started following Jesus when I was like, 14, 15. And I remember even like as a, as a young girl being, captivated and compelled by this idea of finishing the race. You know, I was, I was young and I was, I was fired up by how Jesus had changed my life. And I, of course, I was inspired by other young Christians who were, were all guns blazing for Jesus. But I remember like God putting on my heart at that young age, you know, you're in a race and you run to the end and that need to, to persevere and endure. And I'm sure we can, we can think of people in our lives, I, I certainly can, who, who, yes, follow Jesus, but you know they're, they're running. You know, they've not, not just decided to follow Jesus, not just committed to him, but you can see that they're running. And it's so inspiring to see other people run after Jesus and run till the end. You know, I think about people in, in our church family who have passed away relatively recently um, Adrian and George and James and, you know, John Glenn and Hugh Evans. And if you knew any of these men, what a, what a privilege it was to see them run till the very end. And you see, the Hebrews, the church, they, they'd gotten tired. 
they'd gotten tired and they'd lost their their vigilance, they'd lost their passion, they'd lost their spiritual edge. They were still, you know, they were still Christians, but they they were coasting, they'd lost focus. And you see, church, it is, it is possible to be on this race. It is possible to be on your track, to have decided to follow after Jesus, but to, to maybe walk and not run, to maybe limp on, to maybe drag our feet or give a gentle jog. And this passage is, is like a warning to the Hebrews and to us to get serious about the race, to get serious about the race, to pursue our journey with God and our Christian lives with energy and zeal and passion and enthusiasm till the very, very end. And this passage also gives us a little bit of motivation for running as well. If you're a runner, you probably need something to motivate you. It might be the thought of a medal or the thought of beating your PB or the thought of earning a takeaway or whatever it is, this passage gives us a little bit of motivation for running our our Christian race as well. It says at the beginning, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, so all these witnesses are all of the, all the saints, all the people who we've mentioned in Hebrews 11, who've gone before us, who's finished the race and who've kept the faith. So I want you to try and like imagine with me now, let's paint this picture. If we're on this race track and our track represents our, our journey with God, and it's almost like we're in this big stadium and the stands are full of spectators and those spectators are all those heroes of faith from Hebrews 11. Now, at first, like, and I read this as as that they're a great cloud of witnesses, as if they're witnessing to our race, that they're watching our race. And I don't know about you, but that sounds quite intimidating for me, not motivating. If I was kind of running a race and I had athletes in the stands, I would feel kind of intimidated by that. It would not spur me on at all. It would terrify me. But there's another way we can read this. The word witnessing here, it can, it can either mean, you know, seeing something, or telling something. You know, we can witness something, we can watch something, or we can witness something as in we can testify to something. And here I think it means that the, the heroes of faith aren't, aren't watching our lives as an event, but they're giving us their testimony. They're witnessing to us. Their lives are witnessing to us. So we're surrounded by these great heroes of faith, and they're all testifying to the fact that it can be done. You can run to the end. You can you know, keep the faith. So we're running on our track and we've got, you know, Moses and Noah and Abraham and Adrian and Hugh and George and David and all of these great heroes of faith. And they're shouting and they're cheering us on and they're saying, you know, I've done it. I've done it. I've got to the end. You can do it too. Come on, come on. You can do it. It can be done. And I, I just love that picture. And I think it's so kind of stirring and inspiring. But you know, as well as, as cheering us on and giving us motivation for the, for the race, this passage also, in a very real way, recognizes that the race isn't easy. You know, motivation and stirring language is great, isn't it? And sometimes that's all we need. Sometimes we just need to be reminded to keep going and those cloud of witnesses are cheering us on. But if you're finding the race hard, if you're finding the race hard this morning, like the Hebrews were, then sometimes this kind of, you know, this come on, run, come on, get going, that can sometimes not cut it. You know, it can sound kind of like shallow and empty. And you might be thinking, yes, Sarah, I want to run and I would run, but I'm, you know, I'm barely walking. I'm finding it really hard. And I love that the Bible and this passage is is real about the, the struggle, and in the same place, you find this, this call to run. Yeah, you must run. But also, it addresses how, like, the reality, how tough it can be. Because we need both, don't we? I think we need both. We need both in this church. And I'm really passionate about being part of a church and building a church where we do both. We are uncompromising about calling each other to run. We don't want to forget that we're in a run and we spur each other on to run. We need that, but we're also not afraid to admit and be real about the fact that we don't all find it easy to run all of the time. Because I think it's easy um, to swing too far one way or the other. 
you know, we can prioritize taking the race seriously and call each other on to run, but maybe not have the space for people or the time for people when they're finding the race hard. Or we can be easily those who maybe neglect to, to remember that we're in a race and we're supposed to be calling each other on to follow Jesus with our whole lives. And I'm like, yeah, the longer I follow Jesus and be in church and be part of church, I'm you know, utterly convinced that, that the Bible and, and Jesus himself like walks that tension so beautifully. That kind of uncompromising calling to, to sacrifice and to give and to love and to serve and to take up your cross, but also that ability to, you know, to stop and show compassion and love and acceptance and have time for maybe those who, who aren't there yet. And I guess that's what that's what I want you to, to hear from this. That's what this passage is speaking to me about as I've been preparing. That, you know, don't forget to run. Please run, 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 run. Keep running. But alongside that call, I think this passage speaks to three groups of people who are finding it hard to run. And I've called those people, those who are weighed down, those who are wrapped up, and those who are weary. So let's have a look at those three groups of people together. So um, firstly, those who are weighed down. In the first verse, it says, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, I think it's really important here that it says throw off everything that hinders and the sin. Because, church, there are, there are sins, there are sins, but there are also things that can hinder us in our walk and our run with Jesus that may not be sins. And for, you know, for some people this morning, I'm convinced there are things in your life that maybe aren't sins, but are hindering you from running the race. You know, remember, it's supposed to be run and not walked or not strolled or meandered gently. And, you know, as a you know, we've got to get serious about the fact of unpicking our lives and working out what, uh, is there anything in our lives that are hindering us from running? Now that could be, you know, it's not necessarily a sin, like I've said, but it's a big, maybe a distraction or, you know, it's a weight on our backs as we try and run. And this can range, I think, from fairly little things, small things like, you know, TV things we watch or the music we listen to to the games we spend hours playing or the way we use social media to maybe bigger things like you know relationships and jobs and things like this and and sometimes I think we need to be challenged rather than ask the question you know is this is this wrong is this a sin because you know, we are unbelievably good as humans at self-justifying ourselves, aren't we? I'm amazing at putting things out of the sin box. I can do that. So, oh, it's not, we're not really wrong because of this. I'm so good at that. Okay. But that is the wrong question. It shouldn't be, you know, is this wrong or is this a sin? It should be, does this help me run? Does this help me run? You know, and if, if it distracts you or if it holds you back, if it, does, if it doesn't help you run, then if we're going to be serious about the race, then it either goes or it changes. So if it doesn't help you run, it goes or it changes. Now, um, one thing for me, to be honest here, like it's been the time I spend on, on social media. For me, I think that's a bit of a, a it can be a thing that hinders. Now, um, when I went on holiday for my family, uh, with my family, I put like a limit on my phone on, you know, I'm not even on like the cool ones, it's only Facebook. Um, so I could like spend more time with them. So I didn't spend as much time on Facebook and be more, less distracted and more present. Now, and I was, I was, it worked for me. Now, is, is Facebook, the way I use Facebook, a, a sin? You know, I think it probably could be for some, but the way I use it, probably not just to scroll through stupid memes and look at pictures of food. Probably not. But does it help me run? Like, no, not really. Uh, more often than not, it stops me being kind of present with God and spending time with him. So I've, um, I've kept the limit on my phone on Facebook. So I've only got a certain amount of time per day because it's my kind of commitment to getting serious about the race. So first of all, yeah, that's those weighed down. Now, the second group of people that um, I think this passage speaks to is, I've called them those wrapped up. 
So as part of that verse, it says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now this kind of, this gets a little bit heavier because, you know, the not, not just those who are hindered by something, but those who are maybe wrapped up in sin. And you can almost like picture it, can't you? Somebody's trying to run a race, but there's like almost like vines around their legs and around their ankles and it's growing and twisting and getting a grip of them and stopping them from running. They're entangled in this sin. Now, nobody, nobody sets out to get entangled in sin, do they? Nobody who follows Jesus says, you know, I'm going to stop running for a minute and get involved in that stuff that I know is going to lead, you know, to death and destruction. It's going to ruin my walk with him. No, what we do is we maybe take a step out of our racetrack and into the vines. And, you know, but before we know it, it's, it's got a hold of us and we become entangled. And the passage is clear, isn't it? It's the sin that entangles us. You know, we are, we are the object. It's like the sin has a, has a life of its own and gets to grips with us. And we're, you know, we're crippled. We can't run any longer. And I can, like, I, when I was reading this, I can, I can hear the compassion in the writer's tone here. You know, it's the sin that, that so easily entangles. It's so, it's so easy to get caught up in sin. It's easy. It's not, it's not a difficult thing to do. And if that's you, I want want you to hear that compassion this morning as well. It's easy to get where you've got. You know, whether that is, you know, greed or or porn or gossip or hateful talk or adultery or addiction or lust or lies. It's so so easy. Believe me, we all know it. It's easy to dip our toe in. And then before we know it, we're quickly entangled. And, you know, if you know that's you this morning, if you... You know, like, I can't run because I am wrapped up in something that I never intended to get wrapped up in. Then this passage gives you a hope that this can be thrown off and that there's, there's a freedom found in Jesus. And God doesn't just want you to kind of be free from that, but free so that you can, you can run again. And then finally, to that last group of people, those who are weary. So at um, the end of verse 3, it says, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And the Hebrews, they, they, were, they were weary. They were tired. They were exhausted. They'd lost heart. And there are some of you this morning who might feel the same. You know, maybe you're on track. You're following Jesus. You've been running. But if you're honest, like, you're just exhausted. The whole thing has taken it out of you and you are exhausted you know just like a a real long distance run not like I've ever done one but a real long distance run like the race of following Jesus sometimes can be fraught with like real pain and maybe some of you are just are feeling that right now um pain disappointment loss hardship loneliness adversity persecution and you're like, oh, I've been on the race, but it's, you know, it's hard. It's maybe harder than I thought it would be. And you're, you're like, your legs, you're trying, but your legs are, you know, shaking and you're weak and you're barely putting from one foot in front of the other. And this passage speaks to you as well. And God is speaking to you today and he, he sees you and he wants to strengthen you so you can run again. So what's the answer then, church? Yep, the passage says, throw off everything that hinders. Great. Throw off the sin that so easily entangles. Great. You know, don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Great. But, but how do we do that? How do we do that? And the passage tells us that as well. It speaks to all those three groups of people and it gives us the answer. It says, by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorned in its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. You know, church, if this morning you're weighed down, if you're wrapped up, if you're weary, then the answer to you continuing to run is in, and absolutely only in, the very person of Jesus Christ. 
you know, yes, it, you know, it might involve some practical decisions. It might involve some changes. It might involve some discipline and maybe some refocus. But we are totally fooling ourselves if we think we can spur ourselves on and change our lives and do things that are going to help us to run that don't involve fixing our eyes on Jesus. If we don't keep our eyes on Jesus, we will either go off track again or get weary again, or we will get wrapped up or burdened again. You know, we are meant to fix our eyes on Jesus for the entire race. You know, yes, Jesus comes into our lives as a savior, doesn't it? And when when we meet him, it's like he starts the race and we respond to him and we respond to what he's done on the cross and we say yes and we, we commit to following him. It's almost like he, you know, he pulls the starting gun of our race. But we can't kind of take our eyes off the guy who's pulled the starting gun and then run the race. It doesn't look like that. Jesus is our race. Jesus is our race. You know, he, he pulls a starting gun, yes, but he runs alongside us. And then he's there at the finish line cheering us on as well. We, we run because of him and we run alongside him and we run towards him. You know, we run to him, the, the author and perfecter of our faith. He alone is our race. And if today you know that maybe you've stopped running, maybe you're you know, jogging or limping or crawling or whatever kind of category you'd put yourselves in. Maybe you're way down or you're off track or you're wrapped up in something or you're just shattered. It it might be that you've taken your eyes off Jesus. And this morning is going to be a morning, you know, at the start of a a new term. What a a better time to, to fix our eyes back on Jesus and look at the person of Jesus again. And you know, sometimes when we, we look at God's word together, we need to get super practical, don't we? And we need to pray some specific stuff and decide some specific stuff and obey. And, you know, if God's calling you to do that this morning, then that's, that's wonderful. Go for it. But for many of us, I feel like God wants us to respond to this passage and this message by just looking at Jesus again and trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to help us do that and reveal Jesus to us. So we're going to spend a bit of time doing that now. Maybe, um, maybe the band can start to make their way up and let's, let's stand together. You know, this is not a time to go and get your kids. This is a time to fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's stand together. Let's, you know, you, you might want to just close your eyes, maybe open your hands and that's you know, that's just a posture that we are, we are focusing on Jesus and we're going to, you know, block out other distractions as best we can and fix our eyes on him. And, you know, perhaps there are some of us here and, you know, you're already running your race and you just needed that encouragement, that, that rally cry to keep running. You know, that reminder of that, that cheer, and it can be done by that great cloud of witnesses, and just a reminder to fix your eyes on Jesus, that's, that's great. But when I was preparing and, and praying and thinking about this message, I had this, this picture of people running. They were on the track and they were running, but their head was down. Um, and they were looking at their feet and they were like limping along and, you know, weighed down or hindered by something and downhearted and weary and just, you know, trying to put one foot in, the, in front of the other and their head was down and their head was down. And, and I had this picture of, of people running like that and then Jesus coming alongside and he, he puts his hand on your face and he puts his finger under your chin and he lifts your chin up and he says, look at me. You know, just like you can imagine, can't you, a parent saying to a child, a child who's like, oh, I can't do it anymore. You know, that King Jesus comes along and he says, hey, hey, look at me, look at me. 
Look at who I am. Look at what I've done. Look at who you are. Remember me. Remember what I am to you. Remember what I've done for you. And he just starts speaking life and truth over you as he lifts your head. And in a second, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. And I trust that as we pray and as we sing, some of you are going to lock eyes with Jesus. Some of you are going to lock eyes with Jesus as he lifts your chin and he says, hey, look at me. Look at me. Let's pray. Oh, Holy Spirit, all across this room, all across this room, Would you help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith? Oh, Jesus, for all those who are running, for all those that have been running and continue to run, would they hear an encouragement and a rally cry and that well done and from that great cloud of witnesses and from you, God? Oh, Jesus, for those who are weighed down for those who are wrapped up for those who need to throw things off God I just I pray that that might be done by fixing our eyes on you Jesus we can't throw things off ourselves we recognize we're we're weak would you as we look to you as we lock eyes on you would you give us strength and boldness and conviction that we need to be able to throw things off and maybe start to pick up the pace and run again and for those who are weary God for those across the room who are like God I'm so tired for those who are weary you understand Jesus I thank you Jesus that you ran your own race I thank you that you ran to the end for us I thank you that you understand pain and exhaustion and loss and suffering would you bring strength and comfort Lord lift all of our heads to see you more clearly we want to gaze upon you King Jesus Reveal yourself to us in a, in a new and a fresh way. Would you? We want to be people who run, Lord. We want to be people who run. We want to be a church that runs and doesn't stop running until you come back. Yes, Jesus. Help us. Help us to take our race as seriously as you took yours. Oh. Amen. Let's sing together.